Well, good morning. And good morning, everybody over in the chapel this morning. All right, you, you're not in the chapel. You guys are in the chapel over there. All right, so I don't know. It had some, we've been having some really warm weather recently. Back at last, well, last weekend. Last weekend was really warm for Thanksgiving weekend. So I don't know what you did. I know what I did in the warm weather. I put up Christmas lights. Anybody else put up Christmas lights last weekend or this weekend? So I brought with me my box of lights here this morning. And these are all the lights that didn't go on my house. This is one of the boxes of lights that I have. And these are lights that didn't make it onto my house. Now, I've been doing this for years. You'd think I would learn, you know. But I started putting up the lights before I did something else I needed to do before putting them on the house. And one of the things you always do before you put them up is you plug them in to see if they work, right? So I didn't do that. Oh, those work. All right, I could have used those. All right, they were good. And then uh, let's take a look at these. And these don't work. And so that's why they're in this box. Because, you know, what I did was I put them up and then I turned them on and some of them didn't work. So then what do you got to do? You got to decide, hey, do I take them down and get... But no, then I got this other box, right? And in this box are all the replacement bulbs, right, that I've saved up over here. So I had to get my bulb checker out and check each individual bulb till I got to the culprit and replace that one. There actually happened to be multiple bulbs that weren't working on that particular strand. And so I did that. Now, if I hadn't found them, if I hadn't put them up already, I would not have gone to this box. What would I have done? I would have gone to the store. And I would have bought a new strand of lights and not bothered with this box. And that's why I have a box full of lights that don't work. They still sit in my basement. I carry around. I move them from house to house every time we move. I carry them with me. I just don't. There's got to be a way to recycle these, I think. And so that's part of what we do. That's the ritual of Christmas, right? But two things here. One is we want lights that work. The other thing is I put these on during the daytime and I stood back and I'm like, oh, they look all right. Because in the daylight, when you've got all this light and the sun is shining and it's 65 degrees out, it just doesn't have a big impact. But I went in the house and we were having another family over that evening after I'd put the lights up and I left them on. And as family members, it got dark and then they started arriving because the sun went down or goes down earlier these days. And so they started arriving and each of them as they came in the door, oh, your house looks wonderful. Oh, I love the lights. This is the first lights I've seen for the, Christ, you know, the Advent season. And so the thing that was different was there was darkness. And lights make a bigger impact in darkness than they do in the daytime. That it's in the darkness that we really appreciate the light. It's in the darkness that the light makes an impact. And we certainly want lights that work. And that's what we love about this season is all the lights. And they make a difference when it's dark out. Now, we, read, uh, we heard read this morning the Gospel of John, and Jesus is teaching at the temple. And it's interesting because he's not only there at the treasury where the people would give their offerings, but he's also there, that is at what, a place called the woman's court in the temple. And just before he's, he, we get to this passage, there's something else that happened. And it, they, Jesus goes to the temple early to start teaching. And early in the morning, as the sun is coming up, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders bring to Jesus a woman they had caught the night before in adultery. We have to understand what's going on when Jesus says these things. Because this woman is brought to him, they, they caught her in adultery that night, and they bring her alone because he's at the women's court. This is the, the women's court, and so he brings, they bring this woman of the night with them, and they say, we've caught her in adultery, and Jesus says to them, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then they began to disappear one by one. And no one was left. None of her accusers were left, her witnesses. Because you needed two or three witnesses to, to formulate a case against somebody. And so they had their witnesses that had brought there. But the witnesses are gone. The, the leaders are, have, have walked away from her. And he says to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I wonder how dark her world was before that. 
I wonder how dark her life was before that moment. Pretty dark. I would imagine it got even darker when she got caught. When they dragged her out of the house and they brought her to the temple. Can you imagine being dragged into the church for an accusation? She's dragged into the temple, into the women's court before a rabbi named Jesus, and they're accusing her. How dark was her world at that moment? And how much did she then begin to see the light when she met Jesus? And it's right after this. So that's why I'm telling you this story, because right after this, this is what Jesus says. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I wonder if that woman had stayed there in the temple with Jesus and listened to those words. But when he said, go and sin no more, he was also saying, inviting her to live in the light. He was inviting her to follow him. He was inviting her to stop being in the darkness and start walking in the light of life. She was in a dark place, and Jesus offered her light in that dark place. And that's the thing about light. Now, the thing that you you we also miss about this passage, and we miss about what's going on, is that this is happening early in the morning. This is happening after the sun came up, and there had been something going on in the temple all night long. All night the night before, they had been throwing a big party in the temple called the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was the time of year when the sun changed, the days changed. It was the fall equinox. And so they were celebrating the light in the midst of the darkness that was coming in wintertime. And so this was the fall equinox when they were celebrating. And in the temple at at, uh, dusk, what they would do was there were these three big stand, lamp stands in the women's courtyard. And on each of the stands were four big bowls representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And in those bowls, they would pour oil. And then they would take the old garments of the priests and put them in the oil, the bowls of oil, to act as wicks. And then they would light all four bowls. It was like they were having a big bonfire party. And they were lighting up the temple at night with, this bonf- with these oil lamps and these bonfires. Not only that, but that went on. They would light them all night. And then there was a band that played. On the 15 stairway, there were steps leading into the women's courtyard, and on those stairs were, were musicians, all different types of musicians, and they were the band, and they were rocking the house. And then the men, get this, guys, the men, not the women, danced. Have you ever been to a wedding? Notice who's on the dance floor at a wedding. Have you, you know what gender's out there, right? But in the temple here, in this act of celebration and worship, it was all the men who danced around in the temple, and they would have torches, like, like sparklers on the 4th of July, but bigger, manly things. You know, these weren't little things. They were like fire. These are big torches. So they got these big bonfires going. They're running around the place dancing with torches and celebrating. You know how long the celebration went? All night. From dusk until dawn. And then Jesus shows up in the temple after this all-night celebration, this all-night bonfire celebrating the light of God, and says to them, I am the light of the world. You start to get it now, don't you? Understanding that what's going on here, that this woman who was in darkness is introduced to the light, and that the people that have been celebrating all night the light of God are now being introduced to the light of the world. And there's same things about light, you know. Light is an awesome thing, especially when you're in darkness. One thing is that it reveals life. And so one of the things that Jesus is saying is that I am the light of the world. He's basically saying I am God's revelation. I am the one who reveals God to you because I come from the Father. I come, and he's actually making a statement of divinity when he says, I am the light. And that's why they're challenging him about this statement. Because he's claiming to be a, of God, of essence God. And he's, John is actually reminding a gospel writer of John, 
reminding us from chapter one, the word became flesh, and that John the Baptist testified to the light that was coming into the world to the people in darkness, that God was coming into this dark world. You know, I know that when you're in a dark place, it's very important to have a good light. I've told you before, I've been caving many times, been in caves. Sometimes I go into caves with people who I trust, but don't always know the way in the cave. And there's one particular person I'm thinking of that usually does this to me. But they, I would go into caves with them, and this was the cave in Tennessee we were in, and they were like, oh yeah, I know how to go through the cave, I know the pathway, I know the way. And you always get to this point, you know, where you're in the middle of this cave, you're in total darkness, everybody's got their headlamp on, and he's like, well, I can't remember which way we're supposed to go. So we start scrambling around the cave, and we're all looking, and well, is this the way, is this the way, is this the way? And we're saying to each other, hey, bring the light over here, bring the light over here so I can see if this is, we need more light over here so we can see if this is the way to go. And he would come over and he'd say, well, I don't know if that's the way. And then we'd check another spot and we'd all bring our lights over and we'd check that and he'd go, oh yeah, this is the way, this is, this is what I remember. And so the light, bringing all our lights together would reveal to us the path. And so we, but we need to do that. We'd have to keep shining the light different places to say, is this the right way to go? Is this the right way to go? And eventually we'd figure it out. But we needed that light to help reveal the way to us. And that's what Jesus is saying. I am the light of the world that reveals the light. I'm the light that leads and reveals to your life. Life. Life is important. Light is important to life. The other thing about this light is he's saying is that light guides our lives. Now the, the Israelites in the temple, when they were celebrating all night, they were actually celebrating something that happened in the Old Testament. And when they were in the wilderness, when they were in a dark time as a, as a nation, they had fled slavery in, uh, in Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, and God guided them at night by a pillar of fire. And they followed that pillar of fire, and that light became their guide to their new life, their guide to the promised land, their guide to new life. And that's the other thing about light. It re- not only does it reveal life, but it also guides us into the new life. And so as they celebrated, not only did the men dance around with torches, but they also shouted something at the top of their lungs, they shouted this. They said, we are Yahweh's, and we direct our eyes to Yahweh. Now, this was actually a theological statement. This was a statement of faith they were making because the pagan cultures around them were also celebrating that time of year. But they were worshiping the sun. They were worshiping the sunrise in the east, and they were worshiping that sun as a god. And they were saying they would actually turn their backs to the sunrise and they would make this claim. They would make this shout because they were saying, we don't worship the sun. We worship the one who created light. We're worshiping the one who created the sun and all the other stars in the universe. We're worshiping the God who created light. We're worshiping the God who said, let there be light. Does anybody know anything about the Big Bang Theory? Not the TV show. (laughs) The science behind that? What's the very first thing that happens in the Big Bang Theory? On the head of a pin was a burst of light, energy. And that light of the that expanded and created the whole universe, that light that God commanded into existence is the light that gives life to everything in the universe. You and I can't grow in the darkness. You and I can't live in darkness. You and I were created to live in light, not only physically, but spiritually, mentally. We thrive in the light. We do best in the light when we live in this light and follow this light and direct our eyes to the light that is Jesus Christ. I, found, I want you to see what happens to life of this plan. I've got a I'll, I'll narrate this for you so it'll help you, but let's run that video I found. This is a plant that somebody's growing in their windowsill. Now, notice time lapse. Notice what, where the plant grows. As it grows, where, what direction does it grow towards? Where the light's coming from, right? And so it naturally, all of life naturally gravitates towards light and grows towards the light. Now, when the darkness comes, 
the someone, this is an experiment, someone brought a candle in the room, and you'll notice, and maybe it's kind of hard to see on the video, but I can tell you what's happening is the plant starts to grow then towards the candle light in the midst of the darkness. So even though the plant is in darkness, it goes towards the light, and then you can see it better here as it grows towards the fluorescent light. Somebody put a fluorescent light in the darkness, and the plant begins to grow and bend towards the light. And that's the way life is. We gravitate, we grow best in the light, we grow and gravitate towards the light. And Jesus is saying, anyone who follows me will have the light of life. So exposing ourselves to light, growing towards the light, will give us life rather than death. We won't grow, we won't find life in the midst of our darkness. That's what he was saying to the woman caught in adultery. That was what he was saying to the Pharisees who thought they were living in the light but we're really living in darkness. You ever know anybody who thinks they're living in the light but really can't see their own darkness? That'll be every one of us. Because, but that's what Jesus is saying, follow the light. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Follow this light, follow me. Because the call is to follow. A lot of times Jesus wants us to follow the light. God, Jesus wants us to follow him because a lot of times what we think, I think when we're in darkness... We typically say, God, come to me in my darkness. God, show up in my darkness. God, shed some light in my dark place. And sometimes God does that. But sometimes God wants to lead us out of darkness. And for God to lead us out of a dark place, we have to be willing to follow the light out. We have to be the ones willing to move towards the light. We have to be the ones willing to grow towards the light to get out of our darkness instead of just wondering why we stay in darkness. Maybe part of the problem is not with God. Maybe part of the issue is that we're not moving towards the light. We're not going to the light of God. We're not following that light in our lives. Now, sometimes we create our own darkness. The woman caught in adultery was a part of creating her own darkness. Her life was dark because of some decisions and choices that she made, but her life was also dark because of other people and how other people were treating her and the expectations they had put on her. And some of us are in darkness not because of anything we've done ourselves. We've been, it, the darkness has been thrust upon us. It's out of our control. It's because of maybe what somebody else's darkness has, has brought darkness to our lives, or we've been exposed to darkness because of somebody else's choices or decisions or consequences. Sometimes darkness is just thrust upon us in ways that we never expected, like grief or pain or illness. Are you in darkness this morning? Can you think of a time when you've been in a dark place? Or maybe you're in that place right now, or maybe you don't know it yet, but it's going to be thrust upon you sometime in the future. You may be in that dark place. Can anybody relate to being in a dark place? What do you do? when you're in the darkness. I can tell you what you do if you're lost in a dark cave. One of the things, if you are lost and you can't find your way out, one of the things you do in a cave is something that's very unnatural. First of all, you don't panic. That's the first thing we need to do, don't panic. Which is very hard to not do. Then the next thing you have to do is actually turn off your light, your own light, and stop depending on your own source of light. And you have to stand in the darkness. And you have to let your eyes adjust to the darkness. And once your eyes have adjusted fully to the darkness, because when you've got a bright light on and you keep seeing flashlight, you've got to adjust to the darkness, actually. And then once you've adjusted to it, you slowly move in 360 degree movement in the middle of that darkness. And you scan and you look for just the tiniest sliver of light. And once you find that sliver of light, once you find that little bit of light, you start to move that direction. That's the way out. So I would suggest that if you're in a dark place, or if you ever find yourself in a dark place, look for the light 
of God in the midst of that darkness. And wherever you see that light of God shining, even if it's a little tiny sliver, minuscule, whatever it is, start moving towards it. And you'll get led out of the darkness. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So it's all about finding Jesus in the midst of our darkness. Amen.